We might say the atomic age started with the work of John Dalton. Dalton proposed the atomic theory in 1803. This picture of the world where everything is composed of atoms helped explain what had been observed in chemical reactions. For instance, different elements always combined to form chemical compounds in amounts that were simple whole number ratios. Dalton proposed that each element had its own unique type of atom with a certain characteristic weight. These atoms were very small solid particles that were indivisible. That was the model of the atom for almost a hundred years. Since Dalton's first conception, the model of the atom has evolved over time. Each time new experimental observations were gathered that couldn't be explained by the atomic model of the day, the model had to be revised and refined. For instance, the discovery of subatomic particles meant Dalton's model, that said atoms were indivisible, needed some work. In 1897, J.J. Thompson was the first to discover a subatomic particle, the electron, through his experiments with cathode rays. At this time, people weren't sure if cathode rays were waves or particles. Thompson was using magnets and electrically charged plates to deflect cathode rays and thereby estimate their mass. He showed that cathode rays must be made up of negatively charged particles that were over a thousand times lighter than the smallest atom. That's hydrogen. Before this experimental result, it was thought that the smallest particle was the hydrogen atom. To account for his observations, Thompson proposed the plum pudding model of the atom. If you've never had plum pudding, that name may not make a lot of sense to you. So imagine you have a dense, chewy cake with little raisins all through it, maybe like a raisin bagel, or a chocolate chip muffin if you prefer. The cake part is the bulk of the atom, and it's positively charged, while the little sweet bits of raisin, or chocolate, would be the negatively charged electrons. The Thompson model stood for about a decade until the work of Ernest Rutherford. Rutherford and colleagues, in an experiment performed in 1909, found that a beam of alpha particles, that's a kind of positively charged radiation, shot at a target of very thin gold foil, mostly passed straight through to a detector behind the foil. But occasionally, a particle would be violently deflected back, as if it had hit something massive. As Rutherford said, it was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me in my life. It was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. On consideration, I realized that this scattering backward must be the result of a single collision. And when I made calculations, I saw that it was impossible to get anything of that order of magnitude unless you took a system in which the greater part of the mass of the atom was concentrated in a minute nucleus. It was then that I had the idea of an atom with a minute, massive center carrying a charge. The results implied that an atom must be made mostly of empty space, but with a small core of positively charged material that contained most of the mass of the atom. This was the nucleus. Again, the atomic model had to be updated to take this new information into account. There was a problem almost immediately seen with Rutherford's model, however. If the electrons are out in this empty space around the positively charged nucleus, what is keeping them from just giving in to the electrostatic attraction towards the nucleus? Why doesn't the atom just collapse on itself from all that attraction? Niels Bohr, who did postdoctoral work in Rutherford's lab, came up with an elegant solution to the collapsing atom problem. In a publication in 1913, Bohr suggested that the negatively charged electrons are found in concentric circular orbits around the positively charged nucleus, much like how the planets orbit the sun. We sometimes refer to the Bohr model as the planetary model. According to this model, the electrons are found at fixed energy levels orbiting at fixed distances from the nucleus. The path closest to the nucleus has the lowest energy level, and the energy is generally higher the farther the orbits are from the nucleus. 
the farther a negatively charged electron is from the positively charged nucleus, the less attraction the electron feels. In the Bohr model, electrons are able to jump from one energy level to another, but they are not found between levels. Much like how you have to take one entire step up or down a ladder, but you're never found standing between rungs. Thus, an electron gains or loses a discrete package of energy each time it changes energy levels. We call this a quantum of energy, and that's where we get the term quantum leap. The Bohr model explained a lot of observed chemical behavior, including why each element has a certain number of electrons available for reactions, the electrons found in the outermost orbits. These valence electrons determine the chemical properties of an atom. The Bohr model is indeed elegant. It's clear and pleasing, and yet it too has been supplanted by another model, the quantum mechanical model. We will talk all about the quantum mechanical model of the atom in another video.